Hello and welcome to Tomlin's Harmonica Podcast, where I'll be hanging out with players and teachers and having conversations loosely based around harmonica. Not only is this week's guest an awesome diatonic and chromatic player, but he's also an amazing band leader, singer, drummer, keyboard player, and lap steel player. Jason Ritchie describes him as a fiery, open-minded, unique, and musical harmonica player. He is the sensational Hank Shreve. Welcome to the podcast, Hank. How are you doing? Hey, thank you for having me. It's good to be here. Oh, it's, it's an absolute pleasure to have you. Uh, so uh, whereabouts are you, are you tuning in from? Um, I'm in Springfield, Oregon. And yes, that is the same as where The Simpsons takes place, believe it or not. And it's uh, just outside of Eugene, and it is uh, two hours south of Portland. So. That's cool. So is it kind of urban or more rural? Uh, where I'm at is uh, pretty urban. Yeah. Uh -huh. <laughs> it's, uh, it's got a mix of everything. That's why I love living here. You know, if you want to go to the beach, it's about an hour away. If you want to go here, go to the mountains, you know, it's a, it's a, cool, it's a cool place. It's a little tricky for touring and things like that. Well, I guess that's goes for everywhere nowadays but i mean it's uh it's a little tricky because you're you know right in the corner of the map so it makes kind of getting out to the east coast and all those places a little tricky but it's a beautiful area and i'm really fortunate to be living here yeah it's uh, it's very high on uh, our list of uh, places to to visit when we get out of uh, lockdown we've done a little bit of at the east coast and kind of new england area and, and really loved it but we want to make it over to the west coast and i've heard all sorts of things from uh, various people from either coasts you know about the west coast being the best coast and all that kind of thing and there's a lot of rivalry i've noticed <laughs> <laughs> yeah i mean i think it is but you know that's that's just me but you know the the east coast is really cool too i've only been to the east coast a couple times but i really loved it i just love uh, you know, the attitudes are so different, you mm -hmm. know, because uh, over here in the West Coast, you know, a lot of people are, you know, like, oh, whatever, you know, but, uh, you know, East Coast is more like, hey, you get out of my freaking way, will you? You know, and it's like, <laughs> <laughs> it's just like, I love that, you know, and it's very cool. Nice. Um, that's why, you know, people from Chicago interest me, too, because it's like they have kind of both mentalities, you know, mm -hmm. and they have uh, and the accent is very, you know, specific and stuff. But uh and, yeah, do you think sorry, that track. no no it's cool it's cool do you think that translates into uh players and styles do you think there's there's a kind of difference between both sides of the country oh absolutely yeah i mean especially like here on the west coast um i've noticed there's there's a heavy presence of you know of swing like there's a mm -hmm. lot of like elements of swing music uh, jazz and uh there's a lot of uh a lot of soul elements too on this like you know we'll probably talk more in depth about you know different players later on but uh you know you think it might like you know guys like paul delay or william clark or norton buffalo you know those are my three like top idols i got a lot of idols but those guys are my main my main guys but um you know they don't really they don't sound like anybody else you know and there's just there's a different there's just a different vibe yeah and it's uh, i don't really have a straight ahead answer for that one sorry but you know i absolutely hear that there's uh there's just a difference throughout the you know the states and it's really cool it's fascinating you know it, it really is because I, I think um you know a lot of people come to harmonica and uh, any instrument and and you know that when they want to study blues and they're just like yeah it's just it's blues and then and you kind of go a little bit deeper and you're like oh there's chicago blues and and you go a little bit deeper and there's the kind of piedmont style and uh, the west coast thing and like it's just so different and it's it's kind of fascinating uh that you know it, basically it starts from a very similar language but it's so broad um which is, is kind of cool because I, I, I've definitely made blues the genre that I'm most interested in studying. And um, I feel that there aren't so many genres where you could make a lifetime out of it. Yes. Yeah. That, I'm right there with you is, uh, you know, blues has always been the genre that I'm most drawn to. And then I guess I identify with the most, mm -hmm. um, you know, I love uh, kind of like what I was talking about with Jason a while ago is, um, I've always, not just straight up blues, but I've always been drawn to like bluesy styled music too, like uh, certain kinds of rock and roll, you know, um, especially uh, as a, when I was a young, at a young age, a really young age, I really liked any kind of music that harmon had harmonica into it, you know, in it, you know, mm -hmm. and so 
um, I just, anything that's bluesy, I really liked, you know, um, it, it, cause there's just that the heart and soul aspect of it. And it's, you, you eventually you see that like, it's the backbone of all of American music essentially, mm -hmm. you know, and it really, you can see where a lot of other styles have come out of that. So, um, I have a lot of, you know, I have a few students where, you know, they're, uh, not really into blues a whole lot. You know, they think it's cool, but it's not really, they're like, well, I'm not really, I kind of just want to learn how to play. I don't really, I'm not really interested in like being little Walter or what, or whatever, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, but, uh, you know, I always say, like, you, you check it out, though, because, like, you'll, you'll, you know, there's a lot of cool stuff you can learn from blues stuff, you know, mm -hmm. so, um, but, uh, yeah, it's, it's funny how that whole thing works, but I kind of forgot what I was talking about, um, but <laughs> <laughs> I, think we were just, I do that we, sometimes. We, yeah. <laughs> we all love the blues. I think that that's the, the main theme. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> no it's true I, I get that um every so often with students where, where they kind of come in and they say you know i'm just i'm just not into it i'm not into the blues um and i, I find that really difficult to understand because because it's so varied um i don't know do you have any any kind of clever clever ways to get people uh kind of ease them into to blues yeah you know what that's that's actually cool and one thing i've learned as a teacher um because one mistake I used to make as a teacher early on was, uh, you know, people, uh, students would say, uh, give me a list of certain players to listen to. And I'd be like, OK, well, there's uh, I give them all my favorites. Mm -hmm. You know, I give them uh, Paul DeLay, Norton Buffalo and Little Walter, Big Walter, uh, you know, all those. But, you know, what we as a teacher, you often forget is that, oh, wait a minute, this stuff is probably a little too advanced to show a beginner. Yeah. Right. And you know, I don't mean that in an offensive way or whatever. It's just, you know, it's like if you were learning blues guitar and they said, oh, well, you should check out uh, Derek Trucks or you should check out um, Joe Satriani or, you yeah. know, somebody that's like way up there. And, you know, what so that can be a little bit discouraging to the student. Mm -hmm. um, you know, some students will view it as a challenge and go, cool. Yeah, I could I could, you know, I'll work to that. And some students will go screw that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So what I've learned is, um, so I always get my students to start listening to guys like Jimmy Reed. Um, also, uh, you know, Sonny Boy Williamson, number one, maybe Sonny Boy Williamson two a little later on. Um, but basically the point is, you know, you want to start with stuff that's, I don't want to say easier because it's not really easier because, you know, there's, there's, you know, there's the um, there's so much depth to everything, you know, so um, but I guess more accessible mm -hmm. is the term that I'm looking for. So I always say, you know, start with Jimmy Reed and, uh, you know, folks like that, because then you'll be able to kind of emulate or mimic their sound a little better, you know, or a little easier. I don't know if that's that makes any sense at all. But um, that's one thing I've definitely learned is, you know, don't. <laughs> don't introduce uh you know scary good players right away because that could be um that could be discouraging but um so i don't know if that that makes sense or not but yeah it <laughs> makes it, it makes so much sense and and yeah you you've you kind of hit it in a nutshell and i think you you might have kind of listed some players that it's it's maybe more about the songs you know it's not necessarily exactly. about the the harmonica it's it's a song which has harmonica in it and like jimmy jimmy reads a great example of that yeah, and I think that's actually that's a way better wording of it. Thank you. Yeah, that's what I was looking for. It's like, yeah, there's there's more of a message there, and um, you're right. It's about the lyrics, and that's the other thing I try to tell my students too. It's that um, you know, by the first at the first listen, if you're not really like paying close attention, if you're just listening on the surface, you might go, oh, okay, that's that's some you know some pretty basic stuff. But if you really sit down and listen to it, you'll go, oh, these are cool lyrics. You know, there's a hook. And they're just great songs, you know, any, if you're into songwriting, you will definitely appreciate Jimmy Reed, you know, cause, um, a lot of, a lot of cool stuff. And also he, uh, on occasion would branch off of the 12 bar blues, uh, uh, format and he would do, uh, you know, like different things like El Dorado Cadillac, also known as if I ain't got you, um, that's got those cool little breaks in it. And, uh, it goes to the five at a different time or something like that, but 
cool stuff. <laughs> yeah, definitely. So um, I, I'm not going to talk tons about the the C word at the moment, but uh, I, I'm kind of intrigued uh, what what it's looking like there because we. So I think that, so we're recording this on the 25th of June, um, and we've just been told that non-essential kind of shops are being opened slowly from the 29th of June. But up until now, we've not really been allowed out ap apart from a bit of exercise and to go shopping for supplies and things. Uh, what's it What's it like where you are? Uh, essentially the same. Um, it's kind of fun, especially in Oregon. It's really interesting. Um, places are starting to open up again. But it's funny because there a lot of people are saying still say, well, stay at home. Uh, but places are open again, but you should still stay home. You know? <laughs> <laughs> that, that's super clear. <laughs> I um, but uh, I actually played a gig for the first time. Uh, let's see, not last week, weekend before last, uh, all the, all the weekends blend together. So it's hard to keep track of, but, and it was at a, it was at a casino. Um, and so that was an interesting experience because right when you go into the casino, they take your temperature, you stand in front of a screen, little camera screen that takes your temperature and you have to wear a mask when you're on the gaming floor. Don't have to wear a mask when you're when you're eating, uh, drinking or smoking. So uh, okay. there's that. I know. <laughs> or and you can you don't have to wear a mask when you're performing, too. But they did have uh, they have, you know, you've ever seen those clear plexiglass drum yeah, yeah. shields. Yep, they had one of those in front of the stage, which actually was kind of comforting. Um, so that it was nice to play again, but it was also very surreal mm -hmm. and uh, just very eye-opening experience. It was like it was kind. Of, it was good, to, like I say, good to play again. But also, part of me was like, "Oh boy, this is a this is different." And yeah. also, that prior week there was a huge outbreak probably about 20 miles away from the casino well about 30 whatever um and there was like 125 new cases or something like mm -hmm. that so we were especially uh stressed a little bit but um so there's that yeah so but there's been a lot of spikes mm -hmm. you know there's a lot of a lot of uh spikes in the disease that are a bit concerning so um yeah it's it's interesting i'll just say that <laughs> yeah it's uh it's kind of strange i mean i i haven't been in the same room with my band in four months and like mm -hmm. we we've tried doing all the online uh kind of jamming software and the latency is just too big so you, you just you can't get any kind of feel happening um so i think yeah we're, we're all kind of itchy to be be in a room together um, but we still can't do that. That's still not something that's been allowed. I mean, obviously we could, if we were being, you know, throwing caution to the wind, but, um, yeah, it's, uh, it's kind of, kind of strange, but I saw that you, you were doing some online gigs. Uh, how did that go? Oh yeah. Those are a lot of fun. Yeah. Those, we, uh, those were out at my, uh, my parents' house actually. And, uh, that was my dad joining me, um, on the guitar on the last one. The first one we did uh, we did as a trio, and it was, yeah, it was my dad on bass and uh, our guitar player, uh, Ken Luker. Um, so shout out, you guys, if you're listening. Um, but, uh, yeah, those were those were a lot of fun. People were very generous. Uh, so thank you to everybody that, that chipped in. That was very cool. Very nice view. So, yeah, we liked them. We're going to – we plan on doing them again here and there. Um, we don't – want to do them too much because you know we want to you know we want to still be safe in the process mm -hmm. you know? so but uh, yeah be uh, so stay tuned for that We're, we'll probably do a couple more here and there uh, it's been tricky um uh, you know because uh, our uh, our drummer actually passed away um let's see about a month or two ago now oh. and uh so that's been difficult non uh, not covid related but uh other um health issues that, and stuff so that was that was pretty sad and that's been a bit of a bump in the road mm -hmm. um so we're pretty much just performing as a duo and a trio at the moment you know we haven't really thought about uh that part yet but mm -hmm. you know as you know it's uh the musical life has a lot of bumps in the roads and we uh we get through them everyone uh, somehow you know? yeah that's true <laughs> so, oh, i'm sorry to but, hear about your drummer that's uh not not a good thing to to go through 
Um, yeah, it's it's tough. You know, it's it's like it's just like losing a family member because, mm-hmm. uh, yeah, band, as you well know, it's like band members um, become good friends and uh, colleagues, but they also uh, you you get like a family like bond. You know, especially when you work with them for a long time. You know, so uh, yeah, it's but uh, like I say, we we overcome somehow. Yeah, but uh, it is anyway. <laughs> yeah, no, I I, uh, I had a. A very serious conversation with my girlfriend, now wife, early early on in our relationship, explaining, you know, the, the kind of the the relation, the important relationships in my life that she would be competing with, including musicians and band members and instruments sometimes. Yes, <laughs> instruments is the big one. Yeah. <laughs> um, so was was lockdown a, an opportunity to work on some new stuff, any new projects or practice? Yeah, a little bit, a lot of like all of the above. Actually, it's been uh, it's been a, a blessing in disguise in many ways. Um, uh, been teaching a lot, you know, teaching through Zoom mostly, um, and that's been really cool. Uh, I've been not only teaching harmonica too, but I've been teaching some other stuff. Um, the drum, I'm teaching drum lesson. That's probably the most challenging because you can't really play together. Mm-hmm. Uh, so that's a little bit. We've, <clears throat> weird excuse me but um been kind of you know as far as harmonica practice goes uh been working on little things that probably like only i care about you know? <laughs> like you know um just as a quick little demo like uh been working on tongue blocking single holes but uh, and i've always done that in certain ways like you know You know, like some of the runs I use are pretty much all tongue blocking, but some of the things like, you know, things like that, I've always pretty much done puckering Mm -hmm. or lip pursing, whatever you want to call it. So I've been working on doing little licks like that, but only tongue blocking just to, you know, just for fun. What I found, like, uh, I have a, I have weird tendencies as a teacher, and or no, as a player, and that's what I was going to say is like, as a teacher, I try not to, because <laughs> I, you notice, I play upside down. Yeah, that's the one thing. <laughs> yeah, I play backwards. Yeah, um, we're going to talk about that. Was, <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. So, <laughs> but uh, anyway, so like, I have a tendency to pucker when I'm going up, when I'm ascending, but when I'm descending, I tend to tongue block. I don't know why, but. <laughs> So I was puckering on the way up, tongue block on the way down. But anyway, so just like little things like that. And, you know, of course, been working on the chromatic a little bit here and there, too. And, uh, yeah, just a little bit of a little bit of everything. I I I don't think I have ADD, but I'm pretty sure I do because uh, <laughs> I have a tendency to practice one thing and then I'll kind of, you know, wander and then I'll eventually work my way back to it. But, yeah, so. But like, don't you think that that's an important part of, of practice? There's kind of deep dive and then you put it down for a while and your subconscious lets it percolate for a while and then you come back to it and like, oh, I'm, I'm doing this now. This is part of my playing. That's pretty cool. Yeah, I think absolutely. I think that's important because, um, well, huh, everybody's different as far as learning and practicing. Um, some people really like to sit down and practice for hours, just nonstop, just boom, 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 crank it out. I'm one of those folks that likes to practice for short chunks here and there, and then either take a break, uh, walk around, do some chores or whatever, or switch instruments, you know, or things like that. Um, because you're right. It just like when you take a step back, you start to think about it, you know, and like, it's a bad it's not sometimes a bad thing to think about what you're doing while you're doing it as far as playing an instrument Mm -hmm. you can think while you're practicing but when you're on stage it's probably not a good idea to think so much you know (laughs) um yeah yeah um and i actually do a similar thing when i'm recording too um oftentimes when i'm in the studio i do a lot of pacing you know and sometimes i'll like i'll be listening back to a mix and um i'll just kind of walk out of the room 
and it's funny because a couple times people thought like, what, the, where the hell is he going? You know, dude, come back. You know, no, no, it's just part of my process. Cause like sometimes if I listen to, I'll listen to the mix up close and then like, I'll take kind of like, a, you know, lap around. Cause sometimes if you listen to something far away, it leaves room to think about it differently. Mm -hmm. I don't know. It's, but so it's just, um, it's good to kind of, kind of take a step back and then come back to it, you know? Oh, definitely. So. Definitely. I mean, there, there's a there's a massive level of fatigue, especially in the studio, uh, like especially if, you, if you've been sitting there with cans on and, you know, you, you've done 20 takes of the same solo and realistically, the best take was take three and everything else was a waste of time. But you feel like you've got to keep keep going until it gets better and you just get drained. Yes. Yeah. See, and this is where we we should probably talk to Rob Paparossi more about this because he's, you know, he's <laughs> he's in a studio like almost every day, you know, and he's got all sorts of great tips on, you know, what to do in the studio, how to get prepared and stuff like that. But um, yeah, headphones in the studio, that's like a whole subject of itself um, <laughs> really is like, you know, uh, especially as a harmonica player, you know, so those of you that are listening that are new to recording uh, in the studio playing harmonica, um, you you'll find that with headphones in you're not going to get quite the same uh read of your tone mm -hmm. if that makes any sense yeah because with headphones in especially like the ones i'm wearing i'm wearing earbud ones right now so those to tend tend to work as kind of an ear plug mm -hmm. and so you get this kind of you know muffly kind of sound and you know you can hear spit sounds and stuff it's kind of gross but anyway so um <laughs> So, you know, you might try recording with one out, you know, or one trick I like to use if I'm using can style, I like, you know, I put one halfway on. Mm -hmm. So I got like leaving my room, you know, room for my ear a little bit and uh, have one fully on. So that's just something to kind of because I've I've met a couple of harp players that were like, gosh, I, I was recording for the first time. and I thought my sound sucked, you know, and. First time I recorded, I thought that too, because it's different, you know, mm -hmm. it's not like getting on stage and cranking it up and just blaring, you know, um, you have to kind of approach it a little differently. Mm -hmm. So but anyway, I didn't mean to rant on that one too, but. <laughs> uh, it's true. It's, it's a different art, most definitely. Um, cool. So we, we, you've already mentioned a bunch of bunch of stuff that I wanted to, to get to. So we'll, we'll come back to some things that you, you've mentioned, but I, I kind of want to get to, to the, the origin story um, and kind of see how you got started. Cause, uh, I know that you, you come from a musical family. Um, don't you, what, what was the, what was the environment like? Yeah, it was great. Um, uh, uh, I'm an only child, so it was, it was, <laughs> I guess that's nice, but, uh, you know, I, I, I did miss having a brother or sister at times, but, uh, I always had dogs and cats. So, I mean, that worked, but yeah, <laughs> no, but, um, so my mom and dad were always in bands. In fact, you know, they're high school sweethearts. So they've been in bands like ever since high school, essentially. But, uh, so when I was born, I was born in 88, um, they were in a band. In fact, my mom would perform on stage when she was pregnant with me. Um, so I'm pretty sure that had something to do with that, mm -hmm. with my music stuff. But, um, uh, so anyway, skip ahead a little bit, um, I'm about eight years old and I hadn't really picked up an instrument yet. I tried a little bit of guitar, couldn't get to work. Um, always wanted to play a little guitar. And then I wanted to play violin or fiddle at first, but couldn't get my hands on one. And then, um, so a family friend, uh, his name is Dino Alba. I mentioned him in a, another interview. So hi, Dino. And uh, he actually came over to a rehearsal for my parents' band and he had harmonicas and that was the first time I'd ever heard a harmonica. And I just was blown away at just how loud and what a big sound of such a little instrument. I was like, that's cool. <laughs> I want that. <laughs> and so, uh, I may have, uh, pilfered a couple of his harmonicas. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, do you know? Uh, but he, he had left them there. That was the mm -hmm. funniest thing is that he had, uh, he'd left them there. And, you know, as a little kid, you know, really think about sharing harmonicas or anything like that so uh but i remember just picking one up and i i think the first thing i did was just <laughs> just a little bend or thing like that because i kind of listened to dino and i just kind of could hear i don't know why i just could kind of hear 
how he was shaping his air when he was playing and stuff like that. So that kind of gave me an idea of what to do. Mm-hmm. But I remember he, then he uh, eventually he gave, he caved and he gave me a couple of harmonicas. He gave me a Wong Star Performer in the key of G sharp. Wow. <laughs> that was my first, my very first <laughs> harmonica. Yeah. <laughs> Um, and so that was that. And then eventually he gave me like, I think a Marine band in the key of B flat and uh, a couple other keys, you know, so over time I started acquiring them, but so then skip ahead, um, a little bit, my parents, uh, their drummer, his name was Willie Weber. And, uh, he was, a he was excellent mentor in my life. And, uh, he actually, Played, he played with Junior Walker in the All-Stars a few times. Also, he played with the Coasters. Actually, I think he, he had a short stint in the band, a uh, later incarnation of the, the Coasters. So that was really cool. And uh, he was also, he was a, he was a blind guy, um, but he preferred the term non-sighted. He did not like the word blind. That was uh, always the, the thing I found interesting and very respect- respectable about him. He just Anytime you hear the word blind, you're like, oh, we, we prefer the term non-sighted, my friend. And so um, it was cool. I just, you know, getting to kind of guide him around mm-hmm. and um, at a young age, you know, it was it was nice. Kind of made me um, appreciate certain things and just think about life differently. But anyway, um, he was the one who turned me on to my heroes. He would give me mixtapes every week. He would come down from Portland, Oregon, and he would drive. He would ride the Greyhound bus down to Eugene. We'd pick him up, and uh, he'd always have different CDs and tapes for me. And so that was my education on harmonica was just listening to all those tapes over and over again and mimicking, you know, just certain licks, you know, um, that was kind of, that's what got the harmonica going. And then, uh, when I uh, got into the school band, I didn't really want to learn how to read music Mm -hmm. or (laughs) I'm interested in that stuff. Now that's another thing I'm working on during these quarantine days. Um, so I figured, oh, okay, well, maybe I'll, I'll play drums. So that's what kind of started the other part of the journey. You know, the other instruments was picking up the drums and uh, doing a little bit of that and stuff. So then eventually picking up other stuff. But anyway, yeah. That's very cool. Uh, so you you were starting with diatonic uh, at the beginning. When did you get into uh, chromatic? Was that quite a bit later? Yeah, I would say it was probably about... Hmm, probably a good three or four years later. Um, well, I'd say like maybe two or three years later, I had gotten my first chromatic from mm-hmm. Willie. Willie had given me, he's like, oh yeah, I got one. I'll give one to you. And he surprised me one day. He's like, here, it was one of the 10 hole, um, not the, not the Coke ones, but the, the Honer Chrom- Chromonica 10 hole one. I can't okay. remember the model, but yeah. And so that was fun. Um, and I remember, so, just, yeah, that was kind of what started that. And then when I started really listening to Norton Buffalo and Paul DeLay more in depth, and also I heard uh, Stevie Wonder about this time too. So that's when I kind of realized, okay, this is a bit of a different instrument, mm-hmm. kind of. I mean, it's very much a harmonica, and there's a lot of similarities, believe it or not, to the diatonic, but there's a, quite a few differences. So that's when I started to kind of realize that, and also I – also realized, oh, maybe I should save up and actually get some decent chromatics because I was playing on the chromatas and stuff like that, and they weren't that great. I'd blow them out within a month or so. So, uh, yeah, but uh, that's kind of what started the chromatic was just, yeah, a couple of years later, um, it just, uh, yeah, the chromatic takes a little bit longer to click Mm -hmm. than the diatonic. It's not quite as, as free. You know, the diatonic you can, you know, pretty much just breathe in and out, you know, or you can pull, you know, you can really pull on a note, smack it, you know, but on a chromatic, you can't quite smack, you know, because if you do, it'll go away. So you have to (laughs) kind of ease into each note. So it's a certain kind of, like a, very much like singing in the, you know, or, um, above the Adam's apple, that part of the throat. But what's cool though, is like once you get used to all of that, that can, that tone can actually improve your diatonic playing. 
So it's kind of cool, but um, sorry, I'm getting ahead of myself once again. <laughs> no, no, don't, don't be sorry. This is great. And uh, it, it's kind of funny that, that you say that it, it, it kind of takes a while for chromatic to, to click. Uh, I, I literally started playing chromatic uh, about a month ago because I spent so long just being like, oh, no, I, I'm, I'm a diatonic player, as if that was an excuse. Uh, and then I was talking to more and more people. Um, I can't remember who it was. I think it, I can't remember who it was. It was Shane Sager or Winslow Yerkes or one of those guys who was just like, it's it's another part of the harmonica. You know, it's it's not a whole <laughs> different instrument per se. It's something else you should have in your repertoire. Um, and I actually, I got a, a lesson with with Shane. That's my, my first lesson on chromatic. Um, awesome. and, I, and I said, well, this is where I'm going to uh, uh, give you, pass on a compliment. So I asked who I should be listening to. And it's like, oh, well, obviously, you know, Stevie and Toots. And uh, you should really be listening to Hank Shreve as well. Um, so that, that's, that's, how, uh, that's how I discovered you. Um, and uh, he was right. Um, but uh... oh, well, thank you, Shane. Thank you, Shane. I love you, man. You're, you, I really appreciate Shane. He's a, he's a killer player too. And I just, I'm, uh, I'm really uh, proud to see what he's done, you know, in the last couple of years in his career too. So yeah, right on. Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. That's cool. Thank no, you, Shane. No, 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 at all. Um, so yeah, it's, uh, so I, I kind of came, came to you thinking, oh, you know, Hank, Hank's a superstar chromatic player, and then there's, there's, <laughs> there's all this other stuff. Um, and I, I'm just, I'm kind of amazed at, at how, you know, you can play uh, keyboard, lap steel, guitar, drums. Uh, I'm sure I've missed stuff. Is there stuff I've missed that you play? I mean, that's that's pretty much it, actually. I mean, I do play guitar, too, um, mostly at home. And like, you know, on some of my records, I play, you know, a little bit of guitar here and there. Um, I also do a little bit of ukulele, you know, from on occasion. Um, and I'm working on getting a banjo, so uh, be uh, stay tuned for that. We'll be. <laughs> I'll let you know how that goes. But no, yeah, that's pretty much it. You know, um, I'm not much of a bass player. Um, mm -hmm. My dad is the, the bass player, and he's he's so good at it. You know, and he's just like a pro, so it's like it's a bit intimidating for me to pick up a bass. Um, I mean, I got a you know a couple little cool slap licks, you know, big big big, you know, Seinfeld style, mm -hmm. but. Um, <laughs> Uh, yeah, no, that's that's pretty much it, you know. Um, I've tried playing saxophone, I've tried playing trumpet and trombone. I've always loved those instruments, particularly trombone. I've always, um, I don't know why, I just love low-sounding horns. Like, I like baritone saxophone, and uh, uh, I even like bass saxophone. The bass sax is really cool, too. They don't, you don't see them too often, but they're out there. But I love the, you know, those horns. Um, the embouchure is just so different, though. That's what really turned me off trying to approach a horn. It's just because with the harmonica, your mouth is over the instrument mm -hmm. or the instrument is in your mouth, you know, which, you know, is like a saxophone. Sure. But, you know, it's just it's an awkward feeling, you know, and so I couldn't get used to that. Same with trumpet and, 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 and brass instruments. I kind of felt, ooh, this, you know, starting this late. It could almost, I don't, you know, it might ruin my embouchure for harmonica. Mm -hmm. And so it's, I don't know, I don't know, because there's a lot of players out there that do play both brass instruments and harmonica. They do exist. So, I mean, but, you know, it's just like, because I've played a certain way for so long, I just don't, I'm scared. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that, that's fair enough. Um, yeah, it's interesting. I, I've, I've had a few um, students who have come to harmonica from saxophone oboe and the, there's 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 definitely a, a difficulty in transitioning from an instrument where you might need to be quite forceful uh to, mm -hmm. to get a sound out of it to an instrument where you kind of need to go completely the opposite um and and work on finesse but but you know i think the musicality trumps everything so if they've come from another instrument that's always going to be really useful um but yeah the thing i wanted to ask is is how do you find time to to work on all these instruments because I, I play guitar and harmonica and i've just started learning keyboard but guitar and harmonica feels like a full-time job in itself um absolutely <laughs> yeah how, how, how do you fit it in uh very carefully okay <laughs> um yeah no i just kind of like i was mentioning earlier you know i do a little bit 
on one instrument and then I'll tend to wander. And also, um, I've always kind of been like this, but I go through phases, um, just like, you know, with TV shows and food. And I'm really like that with instruments, too. Um, like, let's see, probably about, I'd say, 10 years ago, I really got hit bit with the Hammond organ bug. I still, I still am obsessed with the Hammond organ. In fact, I have a Leslie right here. Can't oh. see it, but it's right over there. <laughs> yeah. <Jealous. no>. yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, I, so, cause like I've always loved that sound on recordings and stuff like that, but I never forget the first time I got to be up close to like the Leslie speaker, <clears throat> excuse me, and see what it actually does and, you know, feel the sound moving. And I was like, oh, damn. And so that's that's also when I was uh, I realized, well, it's, you know, there's a lot of similarities between blues harp, particularly blues harp and that tone and the Hammond B3 sound, because the organ, as, as we some of us know, it's like it came from, uh, you know, the pipe organ, which mm -hmm. also uh, eventually stemmed the idea of the harmonica, too. So they're kind of in the same family, kind of. I mean, yeah. in a way, in a way. <laughs> <laughs> um, distant relatives, but they, they, they're related to each other. But anyway, so that's, so I went through like this huge, huge, uh, phase of playing him B3, getting obsessed with the sound. <clears throat> I went through, um, a period where I didn't even like pia playing piano anymore. Mm -hmm. And so I kind of, <laughs> kind of put that on the back burner, but I'll tell you what, recently though, uh, in the last probably three years, I've really gotten back into playing piano. And so I've been, uh, I still play a lot of organ. Don't, don't worry. But, um, <laughs> I really just kind of like really embrace piano and kind of just, uh, just really gotten in back into that and stuff like that. So it's, it's about like, that's to answer your question. It's like going through phases, you mm -hmm. know, sometimes I'll be in a really heavy, uh, you know, this phase or that phase, you know, and it's, uh, that's how I am with my harmonica playing too. And my, my practice, you know, mm -hmm. I'll, go through a really heavy uh, little Walter phase or I'll go through a really heavy this or that. So it's, uh, yeah, it's, I'm, uh, I'm just a hot mess. <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, I, I think it's really useful for people to hear this though, because I, I, I always try and liken any musical instrument to a relationship because i don't know about you but i get students all the time who's like why aren't i good now and you know how why is this taking so long and you know they've been playing for three months and i was like no this is this is like you know when when you met your significant other you didn't think you know why why aren't we married right now why haven't we you know it's a, it's a long-term process and it's a long relationship and there are ups and downs and sometimes it's not the most important thing in your uh, in your eyes at that time, and that's that's fine, and it helps to relax with it. I, I find. Um, I'm super jealous though of of B3, so I'm a massive Jimmy Smith fan. Um, uh, are you? Do you do pedals and everything? No pedals. Um, I don't own any, and they also scare me. Yeah. But I'm <laughs> <laughs> and in fact, I actually don't own a Hammond at the at the moment. I do own a Leslie, but um, I'm using a, a Nord, Nord Electro, and those things are killer. Yeah. They're uh, about, uh, you know, they, they weigh so much less, and they take up <laughs> a lot less room. Uh, and they really did, a, Nord did a really good job of nailing that sound, in my opinion. Um, I just really like them. But uh, no, I've tried the, the foot pedals a few times. Um, tell you what, though, the, the guy that I also play with a lot too. His name is Skip Jones. Uh, so hi, Skip, if you're listening out there. Um, Skip's a killer. He's a rare breed because he's not only a really good um, blues and New Orleans style piano player, but he's also a killer B3 player. You know, and that's that's kind of a thing you probably noticed is that a lot of keyboard players are either piano players or electric piano players or organ players. There's very few that actually do both, mm -hmm. um, you know, the, the way, it, you know, people feel it should, I don't know, lost my train of thought there, but, um, so like, uh, yeah, it's, but Skip though, he is kind of, uh, he is a master at the foot, the foot pedals and he'll do kind of like the, uh, he comes more from the Jimmy McGriff and Jack McDuff school. So he, uh, tends to go for more of that gritty mm -hmm. kind of tone, you know, um, that's why I like Jimmy Smith though. Jimmy Smith tended to use more of a clean, cleaner sound. Yeah. Uh, which was cool. But anyway, yeah, so uh, he, I 
I get to watch him do it sometimes. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, I get some tips from him. But yeah, I'll, I'll come back to that one someday. But yeah. now is not the time. <laughs> <laughs> I, mean, I feel feel like half the battle uh, of B3 is is being strong enough to to move it from gig to gig and having the right kind of transportation to carry that and a Leslie. Um, that's kind of half the battle right there. Yes. Yeah. In fact, um, I was in a band for a while where I was, you know, lugging around my keyboard stuff. And I got a hold of this Leslie pedal and I actually uh, I remember... Because there went through, we went through a phase where I really wasn't playing keyboard much. I was playing keyboard maybe on a f- couple songs here and there, and then I got this Leslie pedal, and I was like, you know what? I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna try to emulate some of my keyboard parts on the harmonica. It won't be the same, but I mean, it'll be something. So I uh, eventually kind of <laughs> started getting away with doing that. Just like I eventually stopped bringing the keyboard and just played through the Leslie pedal mm-hmm. for certain songs and. Uh, it was cool, you yeah. know. So uh, that's definitely a, a cool effect to add to your pedal board. Uh, those of you out there that use pedals for your harp is uh, a really good chorus sound or a really good Leslie simulator uh, because chorus and Leslie sims are different. Leslie sims are thicker because mm-hmm. um, keep in mind, you know, they're trying to emulate um, sound moving. You know, the Doppler effect. So, you know, you're going to get, because uh, chorus sounds are a little bit more wavy in pitch, which is cool, you know, but um, it's not quite a Leslie sound, though. So anyway, just throwing that out there for those of you who are curious about sound effects and stuff like that. But, well, I, I did I, I did notice that that uh, you, you sometimes go very affected, which I really like. And I wanted to ask you kind of what what pedals uh, let's let's get geeky about this. What, what ex- exactly cool. are you using on, on the floor? Yeah, well, actually, it's funny, uh, for probably about the last six plus years, I've been using a Roland Cube. Nice. And uh, I've talked, yeah, I've talked, I mentioned it a couple of times in my other videos, but uh, um, I'm a tube amp guy. I really love tube. I've always have. Um, I started playing on solid state amps just because that's what was in the house and you got to start somewhere. But eventually I made the switch to tube amps and I haven't really looked back. Um I've tried some of the other solid state amp, like, you know, I'm not bad mouthing Quilter because Quilter is an amazing company. They make good amps. For me, though, they didn't quite work. I found them a little harsh sounding, a little just too much, a little in your face. Um, but keep in mind, this was at the NAMM show. And also I and I, the, I also tried them one like very briefly before a gig. So I didn't really get a chance to really mm-hmm. dig in. But my first impression was a little harsh, but anyway, so, um, there's a couple other solid state amps that are designed to sound like a tube, but mm-hmm. they don't really do a good job. But so, um, I came across this Roland cube and it was actually my, uh, my previous guitar player, Stan Welsh. Uh, he actually came to the gig and I was playing through a blues deluxe at the time that I, you know, modded and souped up and stuff. Pretty good amp. And, um, he goes, well, hey, I got this Roland Cube, and I, I got it a while ago, and I really, I just haven't used it. And so we wound up trading, actually, just doing a straight trade. And um, I tell you what, man, this Roland Cube really breaks up well. Sad, though, they don't actually make this model anymore, but it's called the Cube 80, 80GX. Okay. I think. It's either Cube 80GX or GX80, something. I'm uh-huh. But, um, I get them mixed up sometimes, but yeah. So, and it's, if I believe it's actually 80 Watts, so it's pretty powerful and it's got one twelve, single 12. Um, and I play pretty much through the clean channel mm-hmm. and the, it, cause it's got, um, post volume and it's got master volume. So I'm able to dial in a good amount of dirt and, um, I'm using the bullet teeny a lot these days too. So that helps with breakup and things like that. But as far as effects go, that's the other thing that I like about the Samp. It has onboard effects that are all good. Nice. Um, so I've been using, I wish I had it with me. I would plug it in, but it's also kind of early and I don't want to <laughs> make my <laughs> mad. That's fair. That's fair. <laughs> yeah. But uh, it's got two kinds of delay on it. It's got warm and clear, it's called, or clean. And the warm is nice because it just makes it makes the re- repeat sounds um not a little bit more darker okay 
So when you use the clean delay, it makes the repeats kind of, uh, you know, very crispy and just more like your, like your actual signal, so yeah. to speak. So I tend to go for the warm one a little bit more and it's got a tap tempo, which is very cool. Tap tempo, I think, um, it's one of those things like when you start using it, it's hard to go back because you can dial in whatever style uh, delay you want. You know, if you want slap back, you just go tap, tap and you got it. If you want a long, you know, trippy, spacious delay, then you just go tap, tap, or you can tap it to a rhythm. You know, so if you're playing in a reggae band, uh, you'll definitely want this because you can tap it to like the offbeat because reggae is, you know, it's all about the offbeats, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Tap. So you can tap to that rhythm or you could tap to, you know, the the answer to that. So that's a, that's a cool thing also. So move on ahead a little bit. Sorry. And then we got um, the other effects like there's chorus, good chorus. There's phaser and there's flange. I don't I don't really use the flange too much. Um, and then there is the octave. So out of all those, I tend to use the octave sound the most. And the only unfortunate thing is that you only get one octave sound out of it. And it just gives you one octave below. But mm -hmm. honestly, I'm a pretty low tech guy, so it works for me. Um, the only, the other bummer too, is that you can't run uh, certain effects at the same time. You can't run the chorus and the octave at the same time, mm -hmm. um, but you can run the delay and the octave at the same time. So that's kind of nice, but um, yeah. I like this octave too because you can actually play chords and it picks up all the notes at the wow. same time. Okay, that's a big deal. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. Because I remember when I first got into octave pedals, I started with the the Boss Super Octave, the brown one. Oh, yeah. Yes. Yeah, <laughs> it was cool for a moment because um, you have a couple of extra options. But the moment you play a double stop or a chord or what have you, or even a low note, it just kind of goes and it, it's because it's searching. It can't find that mm -hmm. note. Yeah. So, but this cube though, I like because it recognizes all the notes. It's really cool. But uh, yeah, man, that's pretty much what I'm using. Um, and then, uh, so I'll, I pretty much take that to every gig. And what I'll do is I'll pair that with whatever backline amp there is. Mm -hmm. So I get, you know, I get a nice spread and um, I'll ask the sound person to mic the cube so that way that's the signal that's actually going out through the main so that way the effects are being captured out front as well so um so yeah that's that's pretty much it for as far as effects goes uh -huh. well that's great though and uh, i like that you're you're using uh, a roland cube i've I've actually managed to destroy a Roland cube, which uh, I think is virtually unheard of. But I, I'm like, you basically you don't want to buy gear from me because you know that it, it has been treated like absolute crap for its entire life. Um, yeah. <laughs> but it, I mean, it was still working, but it had holes in the speaker cone and like the chassis was falling apart. Uh, and then I got another cube and that, that was great as well. So I, I, I'm a big fan too. And it's it's nice to... It's nice to hear people using probably a much more practical option because I, I think a, a lot of players hear they hear that a basement sounds great and yes it does but how often do you get to crank a basement to the volume that it it sounds great at <laughs> exactly yeah it's just you you reach a point where that and actually i had a basement for a long time too and i that was one of the turning points that same exact thought i was just like you know what? i only use this maybe once every few weeks or, you know, if that, and it's like, if, um, you know, if, if you go to festivals, you know, they'll probably have that amp for you or an amp just like it, you know? And so, yeah, it, it just gets to a point where, and I have a bad back for my age anyways. So the, yeah, that's the other bonus that I like about the cube. You know, it's literally like this big, it's still pretty heavy, but, yeah. um, it takes up less room in the car, you know, and it saves room for the other crap that I have to bring <laughs> and my keyboards and my lap steel and all that mess. But yeah. <laughs> oh man. <laughs> I, I think that the, the bad back is, is probably musicians back as much as anything else. So <laughs> it's uh, yep. part of the, 
the lifestyle. Um, yeah, so I, I wanted to, that I've got so many things I want to chat to you about. I might actually have to ask you for a, a round two if you're keen at some point, because uh, I don't want to don't want to take up too much of your time. Um, but good. I want to chat just a little bit about chromatic because I'm I'm get, I'm starting to get really excited about it for the first time ever. I never really got it until very recently. Um, and well, I, I want to ask a little bit just about how you play, and then I want some sort of some tips. I'm going to use you basically, um, but you, you play upside down. Do you play chromatic upside down as well? I do, yeah. And that it's a weird thing, and it's a thing that if I think about that, uh, just that it, it it really like confuses me, my own self. Like, because <laughs> I play keyboards, you know, and it's mm -hmm. just something I don't really think about. But when I do, it's like. Oh wait a minute! I've been doing this wrong. Ah, oh, forget it, forget it, forget it. You know. Yeah, <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, you know, it's just it's a weird muscle memory thing. But yeah, I've always that's um, like I said, I was I was eight years old when I picked up harmonica, and I was probably about I guess maybe eleven or twelve or so when I got serious about chromatic, and so I just kind of stayed that way. Yeah, but um, I'm still just. <sighs> I'm still thinking about like, okay, I'm going up, I'm ascending or I'm descending, you know? So, and, and you know what it is? It's pretty much just like guitar players who play left-handed, but they leave the strings in the standard order. Yeah. Uh, like, like I think uh, Albert King did that. Yeah. Um, a couple other famous guitar players Doyle did that. Bramall. I think Hen Yes, Doyle Bramall, yes. And I think Hendrix actually played that way at first. I think he switched. I think I think but, Hendrix could jump between the two just just to show off. <laughs> you know what? Actually, you're right. Yes, I did. I do remember reading that somewhere. Yeah. So I mean, it's uh, and you know, I've seen actually some like uh, Deke Deke Hart. I love Deke. Uh, he does the cool trick where he'll be playing, and he flips like mid while he's you know uh -huh. I can't quite believe he's like you know, and he just like keeps turning it while he's playing. It's pretty cool, but um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So yeah, chromatic man. Um, as far as getting started, I always suggest third position. So if you're getting into third position on diatonic, chromatic, it's probably a perfect time to start chromatic um, because I think uh, jumping right into cross harp on chromatic and even first position. Um, they're a little weird, like, because one thing I want to get out there right away, and I've mentioned this before, um, but so if we take a, if I can find the damn thing, um, there it is. So if we take, uh, if you, one thing you might try too is getting your C diatonic and your C chromatic and just, you know, putting them, you know, ne next to each other and just doing a bunch of back and forth. Um, one thing you'll notice right off the bat on a diatonic C, we have a G note, right? Mm -hmm. Two draw. That's like our home note. We do not have that note on chromatic. That note is just totally missing. However, you know on diatonic how you got two draw and you also have three blow is the same note? Well, you got the three blow on chromatic. So you got that note. So one thing you have to realize if you're playing cross harp on the chromatic, your root note is a blow note only a blow note. So, so just that takes a little bit of getting used to. So that's why I always say third position is probably a little better, a little bit more user friendly because there's more draw notes mm -hmm. and it's a little bit more familiar. It's familiar air, familiar, all that kind of stuff. Um, so blue scale. Blue scale is always a good place to start. I, uh, as far as like what chromatics I like to use, I suggest, I mean, the 16 holes are pretty and they look cool in pictures and stuff like that. And they're shiny, but I suggest getting a 12 hole um, because if you're playing third position, your root's going to be at the very bottom. So hole, hole number one, draw. I use a 14 hole. Um, for different reasons. I'll get into that a little later, but yeah. And actually, you know what you do too, is don't even use the button. Try to get as sweet of a sound and also just try to get, you know, as, um, as bluesy of a sound, I guess, without using the button. So that's 
So maybe start with like the pentatonic minor, actually. So if I tab that out for those of you at home, which is everyone, um, <laughs> we have <laughs> we have one draw, two draw, three blow, three draw, four blow, five draw. So you notice the whole numbers kind of are a little bit different too, but that's okay. We'll get into that later. But now, so even without adding the button in, you can kind of add that <clears throat> flattened fifth in there too. Quick side note too, you can actually play a chromatic scale kind of without using the button. It's a little ugly sounding, but it can be done. Anyway, so getting ahead of myself, but so now, yeah, so adding like a little bit of a dip bend in order to get that flat fifth. Now that leads us to the next step, the button. So. So you'll find that, you know, button makes the notes go up. So just for those of you tapping this out, that's three hole blow button in. You really don't even need to finish the scale, actually, because that lick, you'll find a lot of cool licks just in that bar. Oh, yeah. Yeah, then, you know, adding it in to the full scale. And if you wanted to, you can, so when you come to that, what is that, four blow? Yeah, yeah, so that would be the flat seventh, it's flat seventh degree. You can actually get that same note by going four draw button in. So some of you are going, well, so what? I can already get that note by just blowing what, you know. But here's the thing. You can go. You get that little bling, little kind of glissando effect or whatever you call them. So. So just little things like that. How am I doing? Am I going on too long or is this okay? No, no, this this is this is really great. Um and yeah, the the, the third position thing I think is is a great is a great way to get started and get excited about chromatic because it is just yes. it's instantly super fun. And one thing that I've noticed which might help people listening at home with the kind of muscle memory idea is if you think about your third position scale uh, starting in the middle octave on a diatonic, you've got exactly the same kind of note order in terms of draws and blows and and hole jumping. Uh, so it'll feel natural playing minor pentatonic between the two instruments. Um, yes. But the thing that's cool is then doing the octaves and, and getting that huge, huge sound, which is, is why I started trying to play chromatic. Um, I, I I was toying with the idea after watching uh, Rick Estrin live uh, here in Edinburgh and just hearing that huge sound through it. It was probably a Fender Bassman and it was just obscene. It was just so big. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so what, what would be, um, what was kind of the, the next step? If, if someone's been playing around a little bit with uh, third position and that kind of minor blues feel, uh, where, where would you go from there? Oh yeah, no, definitely. And yeah, there's so many minor, cool minor licks you can do. Um, it gets like, just like you just run into this whole huge, uh, just book of licks. And so like the next step, if you want to like, you know, if you're doing that minor stuff, if you do a button in and you pretty much play a lot of the same kind of stuff, 
puts you in E flat. Now I know E flat is an unusual key. Not a lot of folks play in E flat, but though it's a really cool key. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of cool kind of like hack things I guess you can do, or just little tricks, I guess, you know. That was just all draw notes and I'm just going button in, button out, button in. See, for me, I could do that for probably about an hour easily. Just like, I, it's just very satisfying, <laughs> you know? That's just it. There's other ones too. Uh, little snake charmer kind of scales and things like that. So, but um, skipping ahead a little bit, the next step is to really get into major. Mm -hmm. playing that is a thing that is often overlooked in blues chromatic um there i said it <laughs> <laughs> there's a lot of exceptions like for instance um rick estrin does some really cool uh i can't remember the name of the song it's not on a uh, night cats album but it's on his uh solo album on the harp side i think it is um there's a chromatic instrumental he does on there where he does a lot of really cool major style licks um oh i don't want to say it's called the paper bill or something like that i probably have that wrong but we'll we'll get to that later but um and uh once again norton buffalo and paul delay uh they used a lot of major notes and a lot of pretty i call it pretty plain or plain happy you know a lot of those kind of stuff and um, also, there's there's a lot of guys. Uh, Dennis Grunling uses um, does a lot of cool stuff like that as well. Uh, there's also um, trying to think. Uh, of course, Stevie Wonder once again. Stevie Wonder played in some interesting positions though, so you might find his uh, stuff a little hard to replicate. But you know, I'll get into that in a moment too. But um, so major. So it's like as far as major goes. So going back to the blues scale for a second, or minor pentatonic. Good rule of thumb is if you're you find you know your root is draw one, hole one draw, and you go up to hole two, and you do that button in, so that hole two button in, boom, major third. Instantly, totally different vibe, you know, and it's just, and this is where the, I sometimes, sometimes, because I love third position on diatonic, absolutely love it, but sometimes I'll go to, I'll use, I'll want to use the chromatic for third position. That way I can get right to that major note, you know. <laughs> So anyway, just long explanation short, you find your root for third position, so one draw wherever. So find that root, the next hole up, draw button in is your major third. So you can do like if you wanted to, um, those of you that like to work on arpeggios, also known as broken chords, you can go. So for tabbing purposes, that was one, draw, two, draw, button in, three, draw, hop over to five, wait, yeah, <laughs> five, five, draw, then six, draw, button in, seven, draw, and then nine, draw, ten, draw, button in, eleven, draw. Now what's cool is that if you accidentally hit that note in between, it's actually the sixth degree. And the sixth degree is a really great note for major playing. Mm -hmm. Something I actually forgot to mention when I was talking about minor a second ago. You, if you're playing minor, I would avoid that note. So that note right there, that's a B natural. And if we're in D, B is the sixth degree. And the sixth degree, this is up for debate, but for me, I really think the sixth degree is a note you should probably stay away from in a minor key. If you do use it, you can use it as a chord, you know, 
you know, just for a little, you know, little stabs and things like that. But it's not a note you want to hang on, you know. <laughs> Right when you put that there, it's almost like whoa, 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 hang on, wait. I thought we were in minor. What what happened? You know. So anyway, avoid uh, if you're playing minor, avoid that note. But if you're playing major, it's gorgeous. So that's really, I would say, the next step is embracing the major. You know, because even if you do it with, you know, the octaves. Whoops, hang on. You get more of that bebop vibe mm. because that's really what a lot of, you know, talking about bebop scales and things like that. You know, bebop is, you know, either a blues scale or a major scale or a minor scale with, you know, some chromatic passing tones in there. So... That's kind of what you're doing. And um, anyway, yeah, I'd say that's next step is, yeah, getting into that major stuff, man. That's uh, uh, very overlooked. And, you know, a lot of people think, you know, oh, well, that's not bluesy enough. But, you know, it depends on the song, you know, and it depends. Um, just, you know, it really comes from listening. You know, mm -hmm. if the vocalist is singing something kind of sweetly, you know, more on the major side, then I probably want to play more on the major side. You know, you probably want to, uh, you know, try to match that a little bit. So anyway, there's that. No, right. that that's great. And and I, I agree so strongly about the power of major over blues, because for me, blues is all about, you know, major, minor, budding heads. And, yeah. and, and that's what harmonic, like diatonic harmonica is built for minor and, and major, that kind of jump between the octaves which which is just what makes a lot of that second position playing so tasty um and and interestingly i, I wanted to mention because you were talking about that sixth and students might might be a little bit uh confused about you know what, what's a sixth what what i would invite a diatonic player to do is to put on a minor backing track and play the mm -hmm. tube low over it and and listen to whether that's a nice sound or not um if, if you think it's a nice sound I would counsel you to to maybe rethink because um, I think that's where a lot of players have muscle memory around the the nice major notes that work over a major blues like the two blow mm -hmm. the clean three draw and then as soon as they're put in a minor context they've got all that muscle memory and then they're confused why their second position playing doesn't work. Yeah, I've actually run into that before. Um, <clears throat> I was doing. It was one of the harmonica camps. I can't remember when exactly, but we were doing like the the open jam portion of it. And so, and um, I was actually playing guitar for it. And so I was playing guitar and different people would come up and, you know, blow a couple of choruses and we would kind of change throughout. So we started off with a shuffle and things like that. And then eventually it morphed to a rumba and things. And then this one person got up and said, um, let's do something in minor. And I was like, sure. Yeah. So I started playing in minor and they started going, you know, And it's like, I I had to switch back to major. I just, I couldn't let it happen, you know? So, um, yeah, and that's that's really it, is just, you know, knowing which notes to stay uh, stay away from in a minor key. Mm -hmm. um, and like you say, yeah, like two blow. Like, uh, well, if you're in cross harp, that is, you know. You know <laughs> yeah, see, that's where we're getting into major territory, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, by the way, you know, some of my students out there listening will have heard me say this before, but if you're looking for a good ear trainer, as far as like minor, uh, you know, or a good training on the three hole bend spoonful, spoonful lick is the, the absolute best answer for that. Because if we, you know, if you, if you're hitting it in major, you'll know. Try yeah. Oh boy, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, just uh, ear train. That's you know where you kind of get more into the subject of ear training and just little, you know, uh, what tools you could use for that and stuff. So, 
Um, but yeah, yeah, man. Minor versus major. <laughs> Important stuff. <laughs> the <Yeah>. age old <laughs> debate. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, listen, this this has been an absolute delight, and and I, I'm gonna be twisting your arm for a round two. I'm also gonna be uh, hitting you up for some some lessons because I, I wanna I wanna go deeper on this chromatic thing. Um, but before we we call it a day. Um, it, where where can people find out about what you're working on? What what do you want to promote? Yeah, um, usually my website is um, we we update that once every week or every couple of weeks. And um, my mom actually does most of the work on that. Actually, all of the work there. So hi, mom. Thank you, my mom, Lori Shreve. Um, and uh, it's a family business, you know, so awesome. <laughs> uh, and that's a uh, Hank Shreve and that's S H R E V E like Shreveport. And um, also Facebook is a good outlet for that. Um, my personal page, which I believe is Hank uh, Facebook.com Hank dot Shreve. I think I'll, I'll, I'll find uh, it and put it in the show notes. Yeah. My, whatever my profile page is, <laughs> but yeah, I can, um, I might be friended out at the moment and I'm not sure, uh, but you can always follow me and you'll be able to see all the stuff. I'm also working on amp. I haven't done it quite yet, but I'm working on building up my YouTube page. So be watching for that. Um, I'm planning on posting some more stuff on there, but, uh, but yeah, so usually yeah, my, my regular website and my Facebook um, is a good place to see what I'm doing. So, and I also teach, um, for those of you local uh, Eugene folks, I teach at a place called Music Masters, teaching online at the moment, of course. Um, but uh, yeah, Music Masters, and the website is musicmasterstudio.com, and teaching drums, harmonica, keyboard, uh, lap steel, and guitar, all that stuff. Um, I think that's it. For, I think, yeah, I think that's it. I'll probably forget. Awesome. Um, but... <laughs> <laughs> well, listen, I'm going to put all that stuff in the show notes and I, I would highly, highly recommend following on Facebook because uh, Hank has been posting some awesome uh, videos uh, of, of him playing with other people or jamming or it's just it's all really entertaining. So worth checking out. And uh, yeah, thank you so much. This has been uh, a real pleasure for me. Uh, I like that that uh, we got super nerdy. That was uh, that was fun. You can always expect that from me. <laughs> I know. Uh, thank you so much for having me, Tomlin. It's been a huge honor. I've been a fan of yours for a while, and this has been really cool to connect for the first time. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of Tomlin's Harmonica Podcast. Don't forget to subscribe and leave a rating and review on your podcast player of choice. Join me next Monday for the next episode. Happy harping. Happy harping.